Hello, I'm Lawrence and I'm on a quest to uncover all of the memos that Britain and America lost in the pond and one of those memos pertains to sayings and phrases. And stay tuned because you can win a $10 gift card with today's sponsor, Upside. Over the last 157 years since I started this channel, I've talked about how Britain and America differ on some of the words that they use. But sometimes it's not just a singular word, but a collection of them. And today, I'm going to look at some American phrases that I only heard after moving to the United States. One such phrase is, I appreciate you, which my technical team says I should direct at my subscribers. And if you're not subscribed to my channel, do that now! In the meantime, here are seven common phrases that I only heard after moving to America. One thing that you quickly learn after listening to Americans for five minutes is that they have about a hundred words and sayings that were derived from sport. And one such phrase is Monday morning quarterback. And I must have heard that phrase about a hundred times before I bothered to look it up in researching this video. Because when I first heard it, I couldn't really fathom what it meant. Like, in my head, I think I assumed that it described an NFL player that was late to training. Or early. I don't know the usual training schedule of your average footballer. But Monday morning suggests they were late because the sports people tend to sport most on the weekend. If you're a Monday morning quarterback, you miss the match and you turned up to training late. It's got nothing to do with any of that. This is just something that my own brain came up with. Instead, its definition is one that I don't think Britain really has an equivalent of. Because a Monday morning quarterback is a person who passes judgment on and criticizes something after the event. In other words, with the benefit of hindsight. I mean, in a sporting context, we have something similar, which is an armchair pundit, but I don't think that quite means the same thing, because an armchair pundit is somebody who might offer their critique of the event in real time as it's happening. Woo! Call yourself a professional tennis player, Novak Djokovic. I could do better than that, you prat. To be clear, Novak, that's not my opinion. That's just me mimicking somebody who is an armchair pundit. Believe it or not, before I became a YouTube sensation, there was a time when I used to talk to people, and a colleague once asked me if I wanted to shoot the breeze over coffee. Now, I'm from Britain, where 50% of all phrases are related to toilet humour. And forgive me, but as soon as I heard the word breeze, I immediately thought of wind. And when I think of wind, I immediately think of, you know what I think of. So of course I said yes, because deep down I am five years old. So I was very disappointed to discover once we got to the coffee house that shoot the breeze just means to chat idly. Mind you, in situations like that, it's not much different from breaking wind, because I do end up talking out of my ass. <laughs> I'll be honest, this one doesn't come up very often, but the first time that it did, I had to do a little bit of a double take. Put your John Hancock here, said a man holding out an important looking form. Your John Hancock? That sounds like a euphemism to me, friend. And I will not be putting it on this or any piece of paper. But sir, your visa depends on it. And so, as I reluctantly pulled down my trousers, he hands me a pen. Your John Hancock is your signature, sir. Ah, right, happy to sign it. Do you still want... never mind. And while I definitely embellished parts of that story to move the plot along. It does raise one important question. Who on earth is John Hancock? Well, apart from being the person after whom this Chicago skyscraper was named, John Hancock was a founding father of the United States. Not only was he the first person to sign the Declaration of Independence, but his was by far the largest signature on the document. A popular legend has it that Hancock did this deliberately so as to make his signature clearly visible to Britain's King George III. However, evidence points to this story having been invented many years later, perhaps by Monday morning quarterbacks of the day. Either way, with with hindsight of my own, it does make me wonder if that immigration officer only used the term upon hearing my accent. Regardless, it still highlights how the legacy of America's founding still impacts US English today, with the phrase John Hancock a direct link to the country's independence from the British. One item that bears my John Hancock is my debit card. And, as a YouTube sensation who regularly hits the road, I'm always looking for ways to save on gas. During our recent trip to view the eclipse, I used the Upside app. 
which helped me discover cashback offers in the local area for not just gas, but restaurants and groceries. After pulling into a British Petroleum, that's BP, in Walcott, Indiana, I opened up the app and what do you know? I could get 34 cents a gallon back once I hit claim. This amounted to a total of $3.57 in cashback. And over time, it all adds up. Frequent Upside users earn roughly $340 in cashback a year, which is quite a lot when you consider that the app is completely free. Upside is available at over 100,000 locations in all 50 states, including at other eligible gas stations like Shell, Chevron, and ExxonMobil. Basically, Upside makes money from brands by sending customers their way and then shares some of that money with you. Click the link in the description or scan the QR code, find an offer near you, and and fill up your gas tank using the Upside app to receive your $10 gift card. Even after my brain was sent into a trance by the endless stream of soy fields, I was still able to navigate the Upside app with ease. Install Upside today to take advantage of this limited time offer. The link is in my description below. And signing those forms ultimately meant that I was able to legally work in the United States. It was while working in a call centre in 2015 that I remember hearing this entry for the first time. I vividly remember sitting opposite somebody who used to sign off all of his calls by saying, Bye Felicia. And for the longest time I didn't know why he was doing that or why every one of his customers was called Felicia. But I do know this, he didn't seem especially pleased. And then as time went on I kept hearing other people use it. Bye Felicia. Bye Felicia. Bye Felicia except it was never as polite as that. And with good reason, because it turns out this is a phrase that one says when one is done with a conversation, meaning that's it, it's over, conversation done. And for fans of trivia, the phrase seems to have originated in the 1995 film Friday, starring Ice Cube. Bye, Felicia. And as Mr. Cube himself put it, bye, Felicia, is the phrase to get anyone out of your face. You hear that, Max? Say, say that to your wife next time you see her. His wife is called Felicia. Ever so occasionally, I receive comments in the comment section from commenters saying things like this. Lawrence, your channel is hilarious. I don't know, I'm doing jazz hands. And I am as funny as all get out. But it doesn't, I don't know what it means. Other than, I am funny to the highest conceivable degree, which a lot of people will debate including my mom. But that's what it means. When you are something, as all get out, you are really beloved for that thing. Unless that thing is stealing, because most people frown upon that. Even if you're really good at it. What do you steal? Not me. I've never stolen anything in my life, except some chewing gum when I was six. <laughs> Over the years, many people who follow this channel have brought to my attention a phrase that has the opposite meaning on either side of the pond. <laughs> to table an item. Now, this might not be one that rolls off the tongue of most people, but it is a phrase that's used quite commonly in political circles. In Britain, if a group of politicians table a piece of legislation, that means that piece of legislation is on the table for them to discuss. In America, it's the exact opposite. When they table that legislation here, it means that they discard it. Forget about it. Stop talking about it. In other words, suspend one's consideration of that thing. So when I, a British-born American, say, Hey Max, why don't we table my research on 17-year cicadas? He thinks that I don't want to make that video, when of course I do. That video will be coming soon, so stay tuned. <laughs> And finally, plead the fifth, and I suspect that some of my American viewers might be watching this going, Uh-oh, Lawrence, did you get in trouble with the law? And the answer is, n no definitely not. And anyway, that was 12 years ago. But I've encountered the phrase plead the fifth every now and again in, say, newspapers or just overhearing it in conversation for the bus stop. You do hear some crazy things, but I think due to the way people were using it, I understood it to be a legal term, but I just didn't know what the fifth was. What is this fifth that everyone keeps talking about? You know, was it the fifth day or fifth avenue or... Five guys. I was just trying to get my head around America and the way it uses numbers. And it turns out that just like a lot of words and phrases in American English, this one pertains to the US Constitution. The Fifth Amendment. And the Fifth Amendment guarantees the right to a grand jury, forbids double jeopardy, and protects against self-incrimination. And as far as I understand it, it's largely that last part that people are referencing when they say, plead the fifth. In other words, to plead the fifth means to refuse to answer a question because the response 
results could provide self-incriminating evidence of an illegal act. So really, it's the exact opposite of what I did earlier when I said this. I've never stolen anything in my life except some chewing gum when I was six. So it seems that my only way to get out of this is to pretend that I was joking because after all, I am funny as all get out. If I've learned anything from this video and from living in both Britain and America extensively, it is that both countries have lots of sayings. And since moving to America, I've even picked some up. The other day, I caught myself using the phrase such and such is a dime a dozen. In other words, there are so many of this thing that it is irrelevant. That said, my videos, though there are quite a lot of them, are very relevant. <laughs> They are. Especially this one, which is called Four Ways American English is Pretty Weird. You are going to watch that video now. And remember, click the link in my description to try the Upside app today. Until the next video, goodbye.